Good evening, Hope Church. We are so glad that you joined us for our online Good Friday service. And as we wrap up Holy Week, um, just we're excited to be able to bring you this opportunity to, to really sit and process with Jesus. And even though I know we love to have this service in person usually, I think there is sort of a um, a part of doing it online in our own homes that that I really appreciate because it allows us to kind of have this moment of anonymity with Jesus and just sit with no one else looking and really be able to reflect and meet with God on our own. So I, I know that this is going to be just a beautiful time for each of you joining. Uh, and I want to introduce you to our guest presenter for today, which is Irena Jansen. And Irena is a good, good friend of mine, absolutely incredible person. Uh, she lives outside of DC now with her husband, Scott. Um, but she's originally from Croatia, and that's how we started partnering with her, honestly, as, as a church. Um, their, their team in Croatia includes Ruben and Sanisha and Melanie, and you may have met um, at least Ruben and Sanisha were here visiting not too long ago along with Irena. So uh, we thought of them for this Good Friday service, and when we asked them, Irena said she had this amazing idea that God had already given her, and I, I just, I know that you're going to be encouraged by what she has to say. She thinks and processes in such a beautiful way. So I would encourage you to go grab a journal, a pen, paper, whatever you need. There's definitely going to be times during this message for you to sit and process and um, be with God, write things out. So if you need anything like that, now's a good time to go get it. Um, as we go through this presentation, um, Irena may prompt you to listen to a music or song, and we will have a prompt for you on a screen as we go through. So you'll be able to follow along at every step. Um, we also are going to be doing communion at the end of the time together uh, at the end of Irena's video. So if you are able to go grab your, your juice, your wine, your, your bread, whatever you may have in your home to celebrate and do communion together, that would be amazing. Um, so again, thank you to Irena and we're just going to pray as she begins this presentation. God, thank you so much. Thank you for Irena. Thank you for her heart and her message that you've given her. And I just pray, God, that um, the power and the hope of the cross and the message um, that you want to speak to each one of us, that you would speak that and that we would have open hearts and open hands and open ears to hear what you have to say um, and just to listen and receive this, this moment with you, God. I pray you'd meet with each one of us. Amen. Welcome. One of the keys to unlocking the understanding of life is comprehending that joy and sorrow can coexist in the same moment, at the same time, in the same sacred space. Joy and sorrow, pain and peace, grief and hope, life and death. And today we sit in that sacred space. Today, on the day we call good, we sit with death. We reflect on the cross. We will use the spiritual practice of Visio Divina, divine seeing, to ponder the cross. Visio Divina is a practice in which we prayerfully invite God to speak to our hearts as we look at an image. I will share some uh, thoughts and questions first and then we will have some time to sit with the paintings and reflect, both accompanied by music and then for a brief time also in silence. Today, on the day we call good, we sit with death. Together, we will survey the wondrous cross, the cross, the instrument that brings death of life. And in a twist that only God can orchestrate, it is also an instrument that brings death of death. Painful Friday. Good Friday, indeed. Painful. Loneliness, chaos, grief, separation, fear, discord, confusion, sickness, 
death. Our year and our years are pierced by them. We have our communal story of pain and we each have our own stories of sorrow. Mine are not unlike yours. Recently, the ground shook under my family's feet, literally. In the midst of this uh, COVID pandemic that hit all of us, um, and only a few months after my parents had a devastating fire at their house, a series of earthquakes hit Croatia. The epicenter of the strongest one of those earthquakes was in my hometown of Petrinja, where my parents still live. COVID, fire, earthquake. We were shaken. Our eyes were overwhelmed with images of destruction. Char, chaos, and rubble everywhere. Rubble, rubble, rubble. Here are some photos as an example of those images that flooded us in the days and weeks after the earthquake. The trauma rendered us speechless. The tears flowed. We froze in shock and pain and fear. I spent those initial moments being embraced and carried by God's presence through the people around me. I was here in America. My family was in Croatia. I was speechless and stunned by pain. After a few days, uh, I was finally able to read again. I took up an art devotional that I had been reading during that season. And the painting for that day was this. It is a painting by Sawai Chinawong, titled The Glory of the Cross. Chinawong is a Christian artist from Thailand and the painting was made in 2003. At first glance, um, to me, it looked like a chaotic but colorful jumble of shapes. But then, as I pondered it more, the cross emerged. In the middle of what seemed like chaos, the cross emerged. In the middle of what um, seemed like a jumble of shapes that didn't really make sense, other shapes emerged. First, the cross. Victorious over death. Always. And this truth brought healing and peace into my mind and heart. It anchored me. As I searched the painting more, other beautiful and familiar shapes emerged. A crown of thorns. The words Inri the letters in me. Palm branch, fish, dice. Oh, there was a cluster of grapes, even a part of a donkey. 
a water pot, butterfly, a heart. The entire composition just seemed to joyfully celebrate Christ's victory over death. The more I pondered and stood still, God revealed things and shapes. He revealed himself. When I later put one of the photographs from Croatia that we had already seen um, next to the glory of the cross painting, I was struck by the similarities. Can you see some of the same colors in there? Can you see that um, all the reds and oranges, there's even a little bit of pink there, and then just that beautiful teal blue green in the middle that is so similar to what is in um, the painting as well. Can you see some of the same shapes as well? Can you see the cross? God spoke to me even more clearly now through this pairing of the painting and the photo. I heard him say, I am present in the rubble and the chaos. My cross emerges victorious over death. Always. I clung to that. And now we will have a few minutes to ponder this painting and this photo on our own. We will have the opportunity to survey the cross, see what emerges, listen to what God speaks to you. Remember your observations or write them down on a piece of paper, uh, whatever word or phrase comes to mind, the shapes that you recognize, what God brings to your mind and to your heart. You can share those uh, words or phrases with others later when you have a chance, but perhaps write them down for now. First, we will have some time of reflecting on this painting and the photo with a song. After the song, there will be a short period of silence so that we can sit still with the painting. Now, let us survey the cross together. And now we will have a few moments of silent reflection. As we come back from the silent reflection, we continue to survey and marvel at the wondrous cross. As I rested in the comforting truth that God so powerfully spoke to me through the, the glory of the cross painting that we just spent time reflecting on, life continued to unravel for me over here and for my family in Croatia. And the ground was still shaking, literally with aftershocks and figuratively with COVID diagnosis and health issues and other issues. Through an unexpected avenue of homework, um, God continued to divert my eyes and attention to the cross. For my studies of art history, I had to write a formal analysis of this painting here. 
It is a painting by Peter Paul Rubens called The Raising of the Cross. I will now do a really quick formal analysis. Um, it sounds very formal, uh, but formal analysis can actually help us unlock this painting. It, it can give us a vocabulary to begin understanding its language. So bear with me as I do a little bit of formal analysis. Um, so Peter Paul Rubens was a, a Flemish artist and this painting was made in 1610. Um, it is oil on panel and it is 15 by 11 feet large. You can't see here because it's on the screen, but it, it, it is giant. It was made for a church in Antwerp in Belgium, where it still is today in a different church, but it's still in the same city and in Belgium. So let me give you some hyster historical context. So this painting was made during um, Counter-Reformation. What is Counter-Reformation? Let me just remind you quickly. So after the Protest Protestant Reformation led by Martin Luther and other reformers in the early 16th century, um, the Catholic Church officials and theologians convened um, at the Council of Trent in 1544, five through 63, in response to the Protestant Reformation, and they wanted to establish policies of the church reform. They realized the need for reform as well. So I mean, among many other things, they confirmed the importance of images and art in teaching the faithful about the Bible, but they wanted some changes to how this art was made. And they determined some rules for counter-reformation art. They wanted the images uh, to be appropriate and accurate in telling of the biblical stories, none of the added um, stories that were not there originally in the Bible. They just needed to be appropriate and accurate and should not have any added distracting details or embellishments, like no added characters, patrons that show up at the crucifixion, just just true to the story um, of the Bible. But one of the things that they deemed really important and they, they required of all counter-reformation art was that the images should be moving. They should have an emotional impact and encourage piety among the faithful. So Peter Paul Rubens got to work. He was commissioned to make an altarpiece uh, for a church in Antwerp. So the altarpiece is a large piece that is placed at the front of the church, right behind the altar, and is the focus of everyone's attention. As everyone comes into the church, looks at the altar, the altarpiece is there. This painting that we're looking at is actually the central piece of a large triptych, which means that it had three pieces. There was a panel on either side of this central panel, and it could actually be closed like a book, and then which had other paintings on it on the outside, and then opened for special occasions. So this was the middle painting of that um, large triptych, and. Uh, so it was the most important part, the central part. The size, like I already said, was 15 by 11 feet. So it's life size and it's towering above everyone. Um, we have a photo here to show you as well um, of the of the painting of the, this ultra piece in, in the church where it is right now in Antwerp. So you can see, you can see what the woman looks like here and how small she is and and the altar is there and how that you can see how this painting is just big and towering and life-size uh, figures and people would be looking at it up uh, above them. But let us go back to the painting, to the central panel. So a little bit of formal analysis, like I said. So first let's look at the line. That's something that we usually can first look at when we look at a painting. So there's three types of lines that exist, uh, not just in, in a painting, but in the world. There are horizontal lines. They are calm and stable and peaceful. Um, every time we see a horizontal line, they represent things that are at rest and calm. Think of a horizon or the sea. If something is calm, it's at rest, it's steady and stable. Then we have vertical lines. They are gravity defying. They are aggressive and confident and strong. They represent things that are confident, strong, standing upright. Think of a tree. If a tree is standing upright, it means it's healthy, it's strong, it's defying gravity. Um, 
And then the third type of line that we have that exists is a diagonal line. Those lines suggest movement and tension and dynamism. They suggest action and motion and change, urgency, excitement, and tension. And they're also unstable. Um, they are, it's an act, they represent an action packed experience. So think of a falling tree in the forest. If the tree is at a diagonal in the forest, well, we're thinking that it's either falling down or somebody's trying to lift it up. I mean, it's not how it's supposed to be. Um, so it's unstable, but some, it's in motion. Something is happening here. So this painting by Rubens here is the main line here is the diagonal line. If we look at it, we see the body of Christ is on the diagonal. We see the cross is a diagonal. We see that rope there that's on the diagonal. Even that tree up there clinging to that um, cliff is kind of on the diagonal. Even the dog is is on the diagonal. All the bodies and limbs are, are in movement. The main line here is um, the diagonal line. And it is very obvious that a moment is caught here, that that all this moving movement that is happening, these bodies, they can't hold this position for long. In a few seconds, this, this scene will look different. It, this thing will either fall or be lifted up. Um, they can't hold this position for long. This is a moment of action. So that's the line, the diagonal line. Let's look at the light. What kind of light does Rubens use here? He doesn't use an even light that is supposed to give us just information. He uses dramatic light, like a spotlight. And that spotlight is on Christ the main figure. The spotlight is coming. We can see that it's because of the shadows and light that it's coming from the upper right corner. It's coming down and shining on Christ. And that, again, just like Christ is on the main diagonal line, the light tells us that Christ is the central part of this painting. The figures. So the next thing we can look at the figures who is and what is portrayed in this painting. Again, we go to Christ. Christ is the central figure. He has the central place in the painting because of the light shines on him. He's on the main diagonal and he's looking up to where the light comes from. He's looking up to God where the light comes from. The interesting thing is that um, there used to be a panel above this panel with God, the Father painted on it. It doesn't exist anymore, but Christ is looking up at God, the Father. Then, what else do we have in this painting? We have nature, the tree that we already mentioned, and the cliff. So we have nature represented, the gnarly tree clinging to the cliff. We have the dog, which is in action. Um, the dog was considered an unclean animal in Jewish culture, so perhaps it's here as a symbol of the uncleanliness of the world. Um, and then we have all these other figures. We have a swirl of men. Their bodies are in motion, straining. And uh, something else that Rubens uses here is called foreshortening. And it basically means that when a painter paints uh, parts of the body or whatever he's painting at, at that angle that kind of looks like it's extending out of the painting and, and uh, sticking out um, like the elbows and the shoulders. You see that elbow of the man that is and has the blue cloth. It, it looks like it's going to stick out at us. It, it, it is involving us, drawing us in, in the, into the painting. So we have a, a, a swirl of figures here. So we've done We've looked at the line and light and figures. And the last thing we will look at is color. What dominates, what colors dominate this painting? The, there's a lot of bodies here. And so a lot of flash tones, different, different shades, different colors, um, different sh flesh tones. And there, it really is a swirl of humanity. And the flesh tones are emphasizing humanity and also the, this, the vulnerability of Jesus. 
we have some green for nature we have the dog that's white and and brown so we have all those kind of earth earth color so this is something that's happening in the earth flesh and earth are present here but then there are pops of color too there is red there is blue there is yellow and there is silver in that shiny suit of armor there and those colors draw our attention our eyes go to those places and Rubens knows that nothing is painted by accident here we will come back to to the colors and now let's let's look at all those figures and so now that we have all, all, all these the lines and colors and let's look at the figures and see where these figures are looking at we've already mentioned that Christ is looking up at the source of light he's looking up at God the Father the figures that are straining to lift Christ and the cross up a lot of them are looking at Jesus. They are straining and looking at Jesus, the man up. Bob Jesus is looking at him. The man in the suit of armor is looking at Jesus. They're all straining and they're in the middle of this action. But then we go and we follow those pops of color that Rubens places there. We see that red. Let's look at that red. And as we, as our eyes are drawn to red, blue, and then yellow, it's that kind of this swirl it takes us around the painting. And this red, as we look at the man wrapped in this red cloth, um, where is he looking? Well, he's looking out at us. He's looking at me. He's drawing me into the painting. We go down, we look at the, the blue color. And just to the right and a little up of blue, that pop of blue, we see the man with gray hair and gray beard. And he's looking down down towards whoever is standing below this painting and this scene. He's looking straight at me. And then we go to that shiny silver suit of armor and that pop of yellow, that cloth that wraps around the, the body of the man next to the this shiny suit of armor. And then we see his face, his arm, right arm extended to lift the cross and touch the cross right above Jesus's head. And if you follow his arm right kind of underneath his, his shoulder, right above his, next to his armpit, we see his face and he's looking down. He's looking straight at us. He's looking at me. They're watching us, all three figures, they're inviting us in, they're drawing us in. It's as if though they're telling us, they're telling me, you cannot hide. I see you there. You are a part of this. It is you, your sin that is doing this. And I looked at the painting and, and I was overwhelmed and drawn in. I, I kind of, wanted to help these men in their strenuous task. As, as I'm standing in front of this painting and and it's towering above me and these men are straining and and Jesus is, looks like he's gonna kind of slide down the cross and they're looking at me and I think, oh, let, let me help you, let me help you. But then I realize, I realize what that means. I, I don't want to raise Jesus on the cross. I don't want to do this. But then I also remember. But if Christ is not raised up on that cross, if he does not end up on that cross dying, there is no salvation for me. So maybe I do want to help them. And that tension is there. And I cannot stay a neutral observer. I am a part of this story. I am a part of the raising of the cross. And so using this painting, God focused my attention on the cross again, and the truth again. In the midst of pain and death, 
the cross emerges, victorious over death, always. And now we will have a few minutes to ponder this painting on our own. Listen to what God speaks to you. Remember your observations or write them down um, somewhere on a piece of paper. You can share them with others later when you have a chance. First, we will listen to a song as we spend time observing this painting and listening to what God is speaking to us. And then after the song is over, we will have a short period of silence so that we can sit still with the painting. We will have a few moments of silent reflection. We come back from the silent reflection, but our pondering of the wondrous cross does not end here. Today, on the day we call good, we sat with death. Together, we surveyed the wondrous cross, the cross, the instrument that brings death of life. And in a twist that only God can orchestrate, the cross is the instrument that brings death of death. For Christ's cross emerges from destruction, pain, sorrow, and rubble. Victorious over death, always. We can rest in that truth. It is a good Friday, indeed. Amen. Thank you so much, Irena, for that beautiful message. Um, I just want us to sit for a moment in the processing, in the worship, in this, in this moment with Jesus. And I want this to, moment to lead us into, into an opportunity for us to take communion. And as we do that, I want to just share one thing from Irena's message that really stood out to me that I think is important that, that affects our posture of humility and, and reverence and repentance towards God. Um, she shared the image of the artwork where Jesus is being crucified and the, the faces and the eyes that are, that are all looking at us. Even though we're not in the painting, how she talked about the fact that we feel like we are there. And it's the reminder that, that we actually are the reason that Jesus was on the cross to begin with and that he was rejected and despised for us. Um, 
that we were complicit in that. And I think that's a, it's a heavy place for us to be, but it, but it leads us into truly a greater appreciation for what it is that Jesus has done for us. And it reminds me of Isaiah 53, which says this, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And again, that verse just reminds us that, that all the things that Jesus went through, um, we, we rejected him, we, we despised him, we held him in low esteem, and yet it was for us that he was crushed. It was for us that he was afflicted and stricken. And again, that, that artwork just reminds us um, in a powerful way to see ourselves as, as part of that. Uh, part of of the ones who put him on the cross um, and I know that that's a heavy feeling but again I think it leads us to a repentance a repentance that leads to um, to change to transformation and for us to embrace the, the fullness of the sacrifice that God gave for us um, and so I just want us to um, to remember as we begin to take communion now um, that God did not want to leave us in, in a place of, of despair, that even though we were dead in sin and even though we were still sinners, he died for us so that we could come close to him, so that we could know him personally. And that is part of this, this mystery, the beautiful, wondrous cross that we're celebrating. And as we, as we go through communion, and as I read through what Jesus said to his disciples at the Last Supper, I just want you to have in your mind um, the image of the cross, and maybe even the image of the artistic image of the cross and the different facets, the different, um, pieces of the cross that emerged for you as you listened to Irena talk and as you sat and listened through that the worship music um and i just want you to reflect on that as you sit with jesus and as you take this communion today as we begin communion now um i'm gonna i'm gonna walk through taking the bread and taking the, the juice or the wine, whatever you have. Um, but if you want to sit longer in this moment, if you want to really take your time with the bread or, or take your time and ponder the blood of Jesus as you as you take that, that communion juice, um, I encourage you just, you can pause this, you can come back to it. If you need to put the kids to bed, if you need to... Um, come back when you're when you have just a moment to really sit and be with Jesus this is a time for you to take exactly as much time as you need um, so I hope that you will do that and not feel rushed so I'm gonna read Luke 22 verse 17 after taking the cup he gave thanks and said this take this and divide it among you for I tell you I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. We drink this also in remembrance of Jesus and what he did for us. So 
So thank you so much again for joining us and hope that we'll be able to see you uh, for Easter. You may come on Saturday at 6 p.m. Um, we also have the service at our regular time on Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, and hope you can join us for that. So let's pray as we uh, wrap up our time together here. Uh, Jesus, I just thank you so much for the powerful message through Irena. Um, I thank you, God, for leading our hearts uh, to wrestle and process in your presence. I thank you um, for all the wonderful things about the cross that um, that you have pulled out for each of us today. And I ask God that um, you continue to bring out new pieces of the cross, new pieces of the hope and the message of what you did for us that night, um, that day on the cross. And I, I just pray um, that you'd fill each of us more and more as we rest in you, as we trust in you. And we pray this in your name, God. Amen.